Okay, thank, thank you for the, for the introduction. So, um, right, so uh, today I want to talk about lattice based SNACs or subsetting non interactive arguments of knowledge with a bunch of nice properties. And this is a joint work with Martin, Valerio, Julio, and uh, Aravin. So, this is the agenda for this talk. The talk will consist of three parts. The first two parts are rather short. So, there I will, I will recall the notion of SNACs as well as vector commitments, because after all, it's vector commitment day. So, and in particular, I will talk about vector commitments with functional openings. So for these two sessions, I will first recall what they are and what do we know about them in the literature and how do they relate to each other. And then in the third, more technical part of the talk, of the talk I will uh, present to you how we can construct a lattice-based vector commitment scheme with openings uh, to polynomial maps. Okay, so let us start with the first part, that is the notion of SNARKs. So a SNARK is defined with respect to some NP language L, which is in turn defined by some relation R. And a SNARK for this language L is simply a tuple of three algorithms, uh, the setup algorithm, the proof algorithm, and the verify algorithm. And by using these three algorithms, a prover could prove to a verifier that certain statement is in the language. So to do this, there is a, the interface is as follows. So first of all, there is the setup algorithm which generates some public parameters. Then given these public parameters, the prover could uh, input the statement that it wants to prove as well as the corresponding witness. And then by running this proof algorithm, the prover would produce a proof. And in turn, the verifier, when given the public parameters, the statement that the prover wants to prove as well as the proof given by the uh, prover, the verifier runs this verification algorithm, which is usually public. And, uh, and afterwards, the verifier could decide whether or not the statement is in the language. So the most basic property of a SNARK is that of uh, completeness, which says that if the statement and the witness satisfies the relation, then the verifier should be convinced. And conversely, we have the notion of knowledge soundness, which is basically the, the converse of completeness. And this notion says that if there exists an algorithm A that is able to convince the verifier that a statement is in the language, then there should exist an efficient knowledge extractor which extracts from this algorithm A a witness corresponding to the statement. So these two notions, these two properties are trivial to achieve because the prover could just send the witness to the verifier. And what makes a uh, snark what makes SNARKs a non-trivial uh, notion is the property of succinctness, which says that the size of this proof should be polylogarithmic in the size of the statement. Therefore, the trivial solution of just sending the witness over uh, violates succinctness. And in the literature, usually people, when people talk about succinctness, they actually mean an even stronger property, which I refer to as preprocessing. And preprocessing here means that there exists an additional algorithm, the preprocessing algorithm, which allows the verifier to preprocess the statement that uh, it anticipates a proof. And then afterwards, the verification of proofs for this particular statement could be done much faster. So in uh, concretely, it can be done in time, also polylogarithmic in the statement size. So not only is the proof itself uh, short, uh, namely polylogarithmic poly in the statement size, but the time needed to verify it is also polylogarithmic in the statement size. Okay, so uh, SNARK is a very powerful object. So let's see uh, what do we currently know about them in the literature. So here, let us limit uh, ourselves to consider only SNARKs for unstructured languages. So for example, so uh, unstructured NP complete languages, for example, uh, circuit satisfiability or rank one constraint satisfiability or R and CS. And in particular, we are ruling out uh, machine computations. And let us also focus on publicly verifiable SNARKs. So for this category of constructions, uh, here are uh, all the schemes that I could uh, gather uh, from the literature. And we see that all of these constructions uh, does not satisfy uh, the following properties at the same time. So these properties are preprocessing, which I introduced in the previous slide. And uh, the second one is algebraic, and the third is post-quantum security. 
And by algebraic here, I mean that the construction uh, uses only algebraic operations defined over the mathematical structure than these schemes, that these schemes are constructed over. And I use the term post-quantum security in a very liberal sense. Uh, that means I'm counting all constructions that are not trivially broken by uh, quantum computers. So essentially, all the schemes that are not based on groups. So, uh, right, so why do we care about all these properties? Uh, the reason why we care about all these properties is because if we have a snark that is publicly verifiable, pre-processing and algebraic, as well as structure preserving, which is an even stronger property than algebraic, which means that the, the relations checked by the verification algorithm is uh, supported by the snark itself, then this such a snark would be very friendly to recursive composition. Namely, we can use, we can prove knowledge of a snark proof using the snark itself. And this enables very powerful uh, applications such as incremental verifiable computation. So if we uh, consider a different category of constructions, namely lattice-based snarks for uh, unstructured anti-complete languages, then of course, since these constructions are lattice-based, they are uh, believed to be post-quantum secure. However, in this uh, parameters regime, uh, we only know how to construct snacks which are either publicly verifiable or pre-processing, but not both. Therefore, a natural question to ask is, how do we construct snacks which satisfy all of these properties at the same time? So post-quantum security, publicly verifiable, pre-processing, algebraic, and structure preserving. And this is exactly the task uh, or the objective of this talk and as well as this work. So somewhat uh, surprisingly, the main and only ingredient that we need to construct such a snark is simply a, a vector commitment scheme for constant degree multivariate polynomials. And we are going to construct such a vector commitment scheme uh, from lattices. So of course, since uh, snarks is a very powerful object, and therefore these uh, VC schemes are also very powerful, as you may have ex expected, uh, this construction will not come for free. And in fact, we are going to use, uh, introduce and use some new lattice-based knowledge and non-knowledge assumptions. Uh, and I will give some justifications later. Okay, so in the following, I'm going to talk about uh, in more detail about vector commitments with functional openings, especially because the terminologies that I used are a, a little bit different from the previous talks. Okay, so here is an introduction of uh, vector commitments with functional openings. And uh, this notion is also known as functional commitments in the literature. So the interface for this primitive is very similar to that of SNARKs. Uh, first of all, there is a setup algorithm which generates some public parameters. Then the prover would commit to uh, some vector X as a commitment. And then later the prover could decide to open the commitment to some function f, which is admissible by the, by the VC scheme and produce some opening proof pi. And this opening proof pi can be interpreted as a proof for uh, proving that the, the vector committed, the vector x committed in the commitment satisfies f of x equals y for some claimed image y. Now the verifier when given this uh, public parameters, the commitment, the function image tuple fy, as well as the opening proof, could run this public verification algorithm and decide whether or not they believe that uh, the vector x committed in the commitment satisfies f of x equals y. So similar to the completeness property of snacks, here we have the correctness property, which says that if f of x indeed equals y, then the verifier should be convinced. And in terms of security, we consider three different uh, variants of binding. And the first one called weak binding is actually uh, the somewhat standard notion in the literature. And usually it is called a binding, but we distinguish it with uh, the other notion called binding here uh, by calling it weak binding. So weak binding says that it is infeasible to create uh, opening proofs for two function image tuples f, y, and uh, f, y prime for the same f, but different images, y and y, and y prime. So uh, we call this notion weak because it, uh, this notion does not seem to be too useful when we consider 
uh, nonlinear functions f. And for these more complicated functions, it is arguably more meaningful to cons consider the binding notion, which says that it is infeasible to create valid opening proofs for a bunch of different uh, function image tuples, for example, f0, y0, f1, y1, f2, y2, and so on, uh, so that these tuples are inconsistent. And by inconsistent, I mean that there does not exist any uh, pre-image x that satisfies uh, fi of x equals yi for all i's. And finally, the strongest notion of uh, binding that we consider is called extractability, which is similar to the knowledge soundness of SNARKs. And this notion says that if there exists an algorithm which can produce a valid opening proof for some function image tuple fy, then there exists a knowledge extractor which could extract a, uh, a vector x, which is on one hand committed uh, in the commitment and on the other hand satisfies f of x equals y. So in terms of efficiency, we again consider uh, two notions, one stronger than the other. The first one is called, uh, we call the first one succinctness, uh, which should not be confused with the succinctness of snacks. And here, uh, succinctness requires that the size of an opening proof, as well as the commitment, is polylogarithmic in the size of the committed vector x. But then these uh, sizes are allowed to grow linearly in the size of the image y. So uh, this notion of succinctness can be seen as the relaxation of the succinctness notions cons considered for other VC schemes, especially those uh, constructed over groups, because there usually one would require uh, these sizes to be independent of the size of x. But here we are a little bit more liberal and allow a uh, polylogarithmic dependency on the size of x. So naturally to upgrade this notion, we can consider a stronger notion called compactness, which says that these sizes are also polylogarithmic in the size of y. And finally, similar to pre-processing snacks, we can consider a pre-processing property for vector commitments, which says that there exists an additional pre-processing algorithm, uh, which allows the verifier to pre-process this function image to for Fy, so that later the online verification for this specific uh, function image tuple can be done, the verification can be done in time, again, polylogarithmic in both the size of X and Y. Okay, so uh, again, let's see what do we know in the literature about vector commitment schemes. So as we already saw from the previous talks, especially from uh, Dario's talks, uh, all of the existing constructions either uh, supports openings to either position functions or multiple position functions or linear functions. And in particular, none of the constructions satisfy uh, uh, support openings to any nonlinear functions or in the, for example, quadratic polynomials. And moreover, most of the constructions are over some sort of groups. So we have, for example, constructions over unknown order groups or pairing friendly groups. And these constructions, since they are over groups, they are not post quantum secure. There, there are some exceptions to the second point, though, and a notable one is that of a uh, Merkle tree. So one could view a Merkle tree as a vector commitment for uh, position functions. Uh, and here, the vector x is committed by hashing it in a tree like fashion, where the commitment is simply the root of the tree. So for this kind of uh, simple position functions, it is not too difficult to show that uh, the free notions of binding are actually equivalent to each other. And furthermore, since these binding notions are based on uh, the collision resistance of hash functions, it is widely believed that they can be instantiated in a post-quantum secure way. And, uh, and this post-quantum security is also true for other exceptions, such as those, uh, those constructed over lattices. However, uh, a common drawback of all these exceptions is that they only satisfy succinctness but not compactness. So for example, uh, for Merkle tree to open uh, to a single position, uh, let's say position two, we would need to review a root to leaf path as well as uh, all the siblings. And therefore it's the size of an opening proof is logarithmic in the size of the committed vector X. And if we want to open to multiple positions, then we would need to review 
a root to leaf up for each open position. And, and therefore the opening proof size grows linearly in the size of uh, the number of open positions. And therefore these constructions do not satisfy compactness. So given this uh, state of affair, it is natural to ask, uh, can we construct vector commitment schemes which are uh, post quantum secure and compact for any kind of functions? Or can we construct vector commitment schemes that support, that support openings to nonlinear functions such as quadratic polynomials. So now suppose we are able to do both of this uh, at the same time, maybe not post-quantum secure, but let's say compactness and uh, quadratic polynomials at the same time, then it uh, turns out that there is a very easy construction of SNARKs uh, from such a VC scheme. So uh, this construction is based on a very simple observation or a simple fact that the language of satisfiability of system of quadratic equations is already empty complete. And here in this language, a statement is given by a function image tuple fy, where f is a quadratic polynomial map, and y is an image of this map. And the corresponding witness is some satisfying assignment x, which satisfies f of x equals y. So given this setting, it is almost immediate how we could construct a snap from a, uh, a snack for this language from a VC for quadratic functions. And the construction is uh, very simple and is as follows. So the setup algorithm of the snack is exactly the setup algorithm for the VC. And to produce a snack proof, the prover first commits to the satisfying assignment X into a commitment, and then immediately open this uh, commitment to, some, to the polynomial map F uh, and produce an opening proof pi. So the snark proof simply consists of the commitment as, as well as the VC opening proof pi. Now, if the VC scheme is pro, uh, pre-processing, then of course the verifier can pre-process this statement uh, or the function image tuple fy into a, a statement specific of the parameters. And then regardless of whether the scheme is pre-processing or not, uh, the snark verification is the same as the VC verification where the verifier checks that uh, whether uh, f of x is equal to y uh, by verifying this proof. So as we can uh, clearly see, the properties of VCs are uh, exactly one-to-one -one correspondent to the properties of SNARKs. Namely, uh, the correctness of VC implies uh, complete, completeness of SNARK, and extractability implies knowledge soundness, compactness implies succinctness, and preprocessing, of course, implies preprocessing. So uh, by now, hopefully you are convinced that a VC for quadratic functions or in general nonlinear functions is a very powerful object and therefore it is an important open problem to uh, construct them. And this brings me into the third and uh, technical part of the talk where I present to you our construction of a lattice space VC with openings to uh, any constant degree polynomial maps. Hey, so, could you could you say a little bit more precisely what you mean by polynomial maps? Right. So uh, a polynomial map is simply a bunch of uh, polynomials uh, evaluated on the same input. Okay. So that's it. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. So it, it's it's like a linear map, but uh, it's allowed to do um, non-linear things. Mm -hmm. Okay, so the okay, so um, right. So let us get back to our construction, and uh, our construction will consist of uh, four parts uh, or four steps. So in the first step, we are going to translate a pairing-based VC scheme for linear functions into a lattice-based one, and uh, at the same time, we are going to translate a, a pairing-based uh, computational assumption where the weak binding property of this pairing-based VC is based on into a new lattice-based assumption, uh, which actually belongs to a family of assumptions, which we call the crisis assumption. And uh, the weak binding of this lattice-based VC scheme is going to uh, rely on one of these uh, crisis assumptions. And note that after this translation step, uh, we can support linear functions, but then the scheme is only weak binding as uh, only succinct, but not compact. Okay, so uh, in the next few steps, we are going to gradually upgrade all these properties to what we want at the end. 
Okay, so in particular, in the second step, we are going to exploit the ring structure in lattices to get a VC scheme for polynomial openings. And then we are going to introduce a knowledge version of the crisis assumption. And this allows us to upgrade the weak binding property into uh, the extractability property. And then finally, uh, I'm going to introduce some uh, tricks for some new tricks for aggregating um, opening proofs, uh, which combined with the knowledge assumption allows us to uh, upgrade succinctness to compactness. So without further ado, let me uh, proceed with the first step of translating a pairing-based VC scheme to a lattice-based scheme. And to do this, I must first recall some uh, background of lattice-based and uh, pairing-based cryptography. So in pairing-based cryptography, we are given three cyclic groups, G1, G2, and GT. G1 and G2 are called the source groups, and GT is called the target group. And uh, we assume that each of these groups is of prime order uh, Q. And these groups are equipped with a pairing operation, which I will talk about uh, below. So we will adopt the implicit notation of group elements, uh, namely this bracket notation, so that the generator of group I, for example, is written as bracket one subscript I. And given this notation, we can write uh, the group operation within each group additively. So for example, if we are given A in group I and B in group I, we can add them to together and get A plus B in group I. Then we can uh, write the pairing operation multiplicatively. So uh, specifically, if we're given a, an element A in group one and an element B in group two, then we can multiply them together and get A times B in the target group. So an advantage of this notation is that it is easily extendable to a matrix vector operations. So uh, for example, we can express this inner product operation between a group one vector A and a group two vector B. And so that their inner product is simply the inner product AB, but this time in the target group P. Moving on to the lattice setting, uh, we are now given a ring instead of a group. And this ring is equipped with a norm function. So we can talk about whether a ring element is long or short. And uh, one could easily extend this norm function to talk about uh, the norms of vectors of ring elements as well. Then we are also given a prime modulus Q so that we can define a quotient ring, which is defined by the ring R uh, divided by the ideal generated by Q. And finally, we are given some uh, public matrix A and public vector T. This public matrix A is uniformly random and is, uh, is ha it has a wide shape. And the uh, vector T, which we call the target vector, is also uniformly random, and it is as tall as A. So next, let me give you a general blueprint, uh, which is implicit in the literature, uh, of how we can construct a pairing base we see for linear functions. So to begin, let us uh, fix a random vector or point V, which has the same dimension as the vector X that we want to commit to. So in the following, we are going to treat the entries of V as variables and define some monomials and uh, in general polynomials over them. And these polynomials are going to be Laurent polynomials, meaning that we allow both negative and positive powers and, and uh, zero power also, of course. So the first polynomial that we are going to define is actually a monomial called the target monomial, which we denote by V bar. And for example, we can set V bar to be the product of all the entries of the I. And next we will define uh, for each I, uh, for each entry of V, a complement monomial uh, denoted by V I bar. And these complement monomials are set up so that uh, when we multiply vi bar with vi together, we get the target monomial back for all i. So next, I will describe how we can. Uh, uh, so next, we want to encode the vector x that we want to commit to as a polynomial in v with coefficients somehow dependent on the vector x. And similarly, we will encode our linear function f as a polynomial uh, in v and with coefficients, again, given by f. 
And these four uh, polynomials and monomials should be constructed in such a way that when we multiply the encoding of f to the encoding of x, we should uh, obtain a polynomial where the uh, where the value f of x is where the value f of x appears as the coefficient of the target monomial v bar, and all the other terms are uh, should be outside of the linear span of the target monomial. So this is a little bit abstract. Therefore, uh, let me give you a concrete example, which we will use uh, for the rest of the talk. So for example, we can encode our function f uh, in this way, namely uh, as a sum of these uh, complement monomials uh, with coefficients given by fi. And we can encode x as, uh, as the following sum, which is uh, xj times vj. And we notice that if we define these two encodings in this way, then when we multiply them together, we indeed get f of x as a coefficient for the target monomial. And all the other cross terms are of the following form. So they, they are a summation of these cross terms vi bar times vj with coefficients given by fi times xj with all i not equal to j. And what's important about this term is that none of them is in the linear span of v bar. So given this uh, general blueprint, we can uh, obtain a generic construction of pairing-based VCs for linear functions. And the construction is as follows. First, let me tell you how we can uh, commit to the vector x. So to commit to the vector x, we simply compute the encoding of x, but in group one. And in our example, we are computing the encoding like this. And to allow the prover uh, to do this, we need to give away these group one encodings of vj in the public parameters. Now, let us skip the opening algorithm for the moment and see how uh, the verification uh, should be done. So as the first step, the verifier would encode, would compute the encoding of f, uh, but in group two. And uh, for our example, we need to give away these group two encodings of the complement monomials in the public parameters so that the verifier can do this. And next, the verifier would compute a value, which I call delta in the target group, which is computed as the product between the encoding of f in group two and the encoding of x in group one, uh, which, by the way, is given by the prover as the commitment. And uh, the verifier will subtract from this product uh, the image y times the target monomial uh, v bar in the target group. So this. What's special about this value delta is that if f of x indeed equals y, then the uh, then delta would be outside of the linear span of the target monomial v bar. So now suppose the prover gives us an opening proof, which we pass as a group two element, then we can check uh, this pairing equation uh, to decide whether or not we believe uh, we, we trust the prover or not. OK, so given this verification equation, we can reverse engineer what the prover should do. And namely, the prover uh, would compute this group element two, uh, u2, u in group two, as a, a linear combination of these vi bar times vj in group two with coefficients given by fi times xj for all i not equal to j. And again, we need to give away all these elements in group two in the public parameters so that the prover could do this. So now, uh, given this scheme, uh, let me show you uh, some translation rules which allows us to uh, translate this scheme into the lattice setting. So first of all, we are going to deal with the public parameters, and then in the next slide, we are going to deal with the rest of the algorithms. So we recall that the uh, public parameters of the pairing-based scheme uh, looks like this. And uh, to turn this into a lattice-based public parameters, we are going to do three steps. So as the first step, we are going to uh, change this setup Sorry, of- can, uh, I, can I ask something, Russo? Is, yes, is this quad, quadratic size, the public parameters? Yes. OK. OK, thanks. Yeah. Uh, yeah, sorry to, to disappoint. <laughs> uh, yeah, OK. But uh, so, uh, right, so as the first step, we are going to translate this group setup into a lattice setup, namely we turn this uh, generators of group one and group two into our public matrix A and public vector B. 
And then we are simply going to make these uh, uh, elements vj public. So, uh, so unlike in the group setting where these vjs are hidden in the exponents, we are just going to make them public. And, and therefore, consequently, this v bar i as well as the target monomial v bar are also public. But then we are going to do something different with this uh, clause terms in group two. And for each vi bar times vj in group two, we are going to give away some short pre-images, uh, which is a vector uij, so that when we multiply a to it, we get a v bar i times vj times the target vector t modulo q. So after applying all these uh, transformations, we obtain the following uh, public parameters for the lattice space t. Then let me show you how we can deal with the rest of the algorithms. So uh, as you may have expected, this uh, scheme is going to be very similar to the, the pairing based scheme. But anyway, I'm going to uh, 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 explain the construction again, uh, step by step. So, okay, so the commitment is again uh, computed as in encoding of X, but this time uh, computed modulo Q. And again, these uh, VJ values are given in the public parameters, so the prover can do this. And let's again skip the opening algorithm and look at the verification algorithm where the verifier first computes this uh, encoding of f as follows and again modulo q and then compute the value delta which is the product between the encoding of f and the encoding of x which is the commitment and subtract from it the image y times the target monomial v bar again modulo q and Identical to the pairing setting is that if f of x equals y, then the value delta is outside of the linear span of v bar. So now suppose the prover gives us an opening proof, which we uh, this time and interpret as a short factor u. We can the verifier checks whether this short factor u satisfies a times u equals to delta times t modulo q, and whether u is indeed short. So given this verification equation, we can uh, reverse engineer the opening algorithm where the vector u is simply a linear combination of these uh, uij hint factors given in the public parameters with coefficients given by fi times xj for all i not equal to j. So now that we have translated the scheme, let us also translate the uh, underlying hardness assumption, which the weak binding property is based on. So uh, as you may have uh, guessed, the pairing based assumption uh, looks something like this. So it says that given the public parameters, it is difficult to find the group two encoding of uh, the target monomial V. And if we apply the same set of translation rules, we will obtain a lattice based assumption, which looks uh, as follows. So it says that given the lattice based public parameters, it is difficult to find a short pre-image uh, u of again the target monomial v bar times the target vector t. But uh, so here we we need to strengthen the assumption a little bit and say that um, it is uh, also hard for the adversary to come up with a short preimage of a small multiple of the target vector v instead of exactly. So in fact, this assumption, this particular assumption belongs to a bigger family of assumptions, which we call the K ring in homogeneous short integer solution assumption or, or crisis assumption family for short. And uh, since all these assumptions are new, let me give you uh, some intuition of why we believe that uh, they are plausible. So in particular, let me convince you why this particular assumption which our scheme is based on uh, seems plausible. Okay, so first we notice that without these hints given in the public parameters, this uh, problem is essentially the same as uh, the ring short integer solution problem or the ring cis problem. And this is believed to be hard uh, uh, and it's a standard assumption in that this is critical. So therefore, uh, the way to break this assumption is to somehow uh, use this uh, hint, hint vectors uij. And seeming, seemingly the only way to use these hints is to perform a short linear combination of these hint vectors. Uh, 
However, by construction, we notice that the target monomial V bar is not in the linear span of these uh, images in the hint. And therefore, the hints don't seem to be very useful. OK, so uh, now that we have obtained a lattice space VC for linear functions, let us see how we can upgrade it to uh, support openings to polynomials. This step is actually very easy. So, uh, and it's based on the following observation. So we, we look at the verification equation for the pairing based scheme. And we notice that the value delta there in the target group uh, consists of evaluating the function f over a bunch of target group elements. And since we only know how to perform linear operations on target group elements, this, uh, sorry, this forces f to be linear. However, when we perform uh, the translation to the lattice setting, these target group elements become uh, elements over the ring, RQ, where we can perform both addition and multiplication. And therefore, nothing stops us from evaluating a higher degree polynomial over these uh, ring elements. And in particular, we can evaluate uh, multivariate polynomials, uh, quadratic polynomials, for example. OK, so then uh, as the first step, let us see how we can upgrade weak binding to extractability. So to, before we do that, let me first uh, show you how uh, we can obtain the weak binding property from uh, the respective assumptions in the pairing setting and in the lattice setting. Then I will show you how we can upgrade the, the, the weak binding property to extractability. So in the pairing setting, suppose there exists an adversary which gives us a commitment and a function f, and as well as two valid opening proofs for two images y and y prime, then by writing down the verification equations that these proofs satisfy and then subtracting them, we are able to express the target monomial in uh, group two as follows. And this expression is uh, well defined because y is not equal to y prime and therefore we can uh, therefore, this value 1 over y prime minus y is well defined. So, so what we just did is that we use an adversary against weak binding to produce the group 2 encoding of uh, v bar. However, we just assume that this is hard to do uh, by the pairing based assumption. And therefore, we, we conclude that this adversary is unlikely to exist. In the lattice setting, the reasoning is very similar, except that we need to further restrict our function f and the vector uh, x that we commit to. So to be concrete, we want f to be of constant degree. And in the expanded form, we want the coefficients of f to be short. And, and at the same time, we also want our vector x that is committed uh, to also be short. So given this restriction, the reasoning is exactly the same. So suppose an adversary gives us a commitment, a function, and some opening proofs for uh, y and y prime. Again, we can write down the verification relations and subtract them so that we obtain the following relation. Now, since these opening proofs u and u prime are supposed to be short, so their difference is also short. And by our restrictions on f and x, uh, we can conclude that these images y and y prime are also short because they are equal to, they are supposedly equal to f of x. And therefore the difference between them is also short. But what we just did now is that we find a short pre-image of a small multiple of v bar times t. And by the crisis assumption, we uh, assume that this is hard to do. And therefore we conclude that such an adversary should not exist. So then to upgrade this uh, weak binding notion to extractability, the first question that we ask ourselves is that, can we do this in a black box way? And uh, so in fact, for linear functions, we can indeed show that uh, pretty easily, show that using linear algebra, the free notions of bindings are actually equivalent. However, for nonlinear functions, especially for uh, polynomials of degree at least two, that is, there is actually a black box separation. So this black box separation is due to, ultimately due to the impossibility results by uh, Gentry and Wicks, uh, who show that it is impossible to reduce any falsifiable assumption in a black box manner to the adaptive soundness of a schnapp 
Here, a snark with a G is similar to a snark, uh, but uh, except that there is no knowledge extracted. So the snark, the snark only satisfies soundness, but not knowledge soundness. And on the other hand, it is uh, quite trivial to see that if we have a VC scheme for quadratic polynomials, which is also binding, then we immediately get an adaptively sound snark for uh, quadratic equations. And just now in the previous slide, we show that from a falsifiable assumption, namely the crisis assumption, we are able to get weak binding for such a VC scheme. And therefore combining all these three uh, implications together, we conclude that uh, there is no black box way to reduce uh, weak binding to binding. And therefore to conclude, we need a new lattice-based uh, knowledge assumption in order to prove binding, not to mention extractability. And, and this uh, lattice-based knowledge assumption is the following. So um, here we consider an algorithm A, which is given some short pre-images UI of some images uh, VI times T. And uh, suppose this algorithm after giving this, after given these hints is able to produce a short pre-image U of C times T of some uh, ring element C. Then uh, this assumption says that there exists an efficient extractor, knowledge extractor, which can extract from this algorithm uh, an expression of this element C as a short linear combination of these elements uh, VI with coefficients given by uh, some short XIs. So again, since this is a new assumption, let me give you uh, some intuition of why this might be plausible. So uh, in order to break this assumption, uh, basically what we need to do is to construct an algorithm A, which is able to find these pre-images U without using the hint vectors uh, UI. And one way of doing so is to simply sample this pre-image U randomly, let's say from a Gaussian distribution. However, if we do this, the distribution of A times U would be close to uniform. And in particular, A times U would be very likely outside of the linear span of T. And therefore it won't be equal to C times T for some uh, C. And therefore it seems that the only way to produce such a short pre-image is to perform a short linear combination. And if the adversary simply does this, then uh, we can uh, intuitively argue that an extractor exists. So now that we are equipped with this uh, knowledge crisis of knowledge assumption, let us see how we can achieve extractability. So let us recall that uh, the commitment is simply a, a linear combination of the of, of these uh, monomials vi with coefficients given by the coefficients of x xi. So we are going to perform the following modification. We simply modify the scheme so that an opening proof also consists of a, another short pre-image u prime uh, of the commitment times the target vector t. And we argue that with this modification, the scheme uh, is already extracted. So uh, here's the proof sketch. So suppose we have an adversary that uh, is able to produce a commitment, a function image tuple, as well as an opening proof, which now consists of a, uh, an opening U and a, sorry, and a pre-image U and also a new pre-image U prime, which we introduced above. Then using the crisis of knowledge assumption, we are able to extract a short linear combination uh, of these VIs to express uh, the commitment C. And next we, we simply argue that this extractor vector X star will satisfy f of x star equals y with very high probability. So suppose this is not the case, then uh, let's say f of x star is equal to y prime, which is not equal to y. Then we can uh, run, the, uh, run the opening algorithm honestly on uh, f to produce an opening proof for f y prime. But what we just did is that uh, first of all, we get an opening proof for Fy from the adversary. And on the other hand, we are able to produce a valid opening proof for Fy prime. And this means that we are able to break weak binding. However, we just show that by the crisis assumption, our scheme is weak binding. And so 
therefore this seems infeasible and uh, we conclude that f of x star should be equal, equal to one. So for the interest of time, let me quickly go through how we can get a uh, compactness. So, uh, right, so let me simply skip this slide. And to get compactness, we essentially program a ring sys instance in the public parameters, uh, where this ring sys instance, instance is given by a vector h. And we want that this ring sys instance uh, has a, a modulus p, which is much, much smaller than the modulus q of the VC skip. And the idea is that we will use this ring sys instance uh, for the coefficients that we need to perform a, a linear combination over a bunch of different uh, op opening proofs so that we can aggregate these opening proofs into a single. So more concretely, to prove that fi of x equals yi for all i, the prover would instead prove this compressed relation, which says that the summation of hifi evaluated that x is equal to the summation of hi yi. So to give you a sense of why this is secure, let me uh, try to reduce the extractability of the single function scheme to the extractability of this multi-function scheme. So uh, by the extractability of the single function scheme, the extractor is able to extract some uh, pre-image x, which satisfies this compressed relation that the summation of f hifi uh, evaluated that x is equal to the summation of hiyi. And if we move these terms around, we obtain the following relation. So suppose now fi of x is not equal to yi for some i, then uh, we can conclude that this vector, which cons uh, whose entries consist of fi of x minus yi, is actually a short non-zero non solution to the ring cis instance x. And cis since we believe that ring cis is hard, therefore uh, we are convinced that this should this vector should be a zero vector, and therefore fi of x is equal to yi for all i. So, right. So I think I'm running out of time, and uh, I would simply conclude my talk here. So I'm happy to take any questions. There was a question in the chat. Um, the question was as follows. Um, if I understood correctly, binding is equivalent to extractability for linear algebra relationships. If so, can you elaborate on that? Uh, right, yeah, that, that, is, that is true, uh, especially over when, when the linear functions are defined over a finite field. And the reason is simply uh, linear algebra. So you can, if there is an, uh, if you can collect a bunch of uh, opening proofs for some inconsistent uh, function image tuple, and then you can perform Gaussian elimination so that you can get uh, two linear functions uh, evaluated on the same X with uh, two different images. And, and yeah, with that you, you break weak binding. But okay, but the question is about uh, the relation between binding and uh, extractability. Okay, so for extractability, it's very simple. So you, you simply solve the system of, li of linear equation if it is uh, consistent. And uh, so by solving the system of linear equation, you are able to extract the, uh, uh, a pre-image. Ari is asking if, if you can say something about the size of the opening proofs as a function of the vector length. Right, so the size of an opening proof is going to be polylogarithmic in both uh, the committed vector as well as the number of functions that you open to. Um, I have a question, which is a, a little more um, high level, and it's about the uh, knowledge assumption, right? So right. yes, the new assumption, make it or break it. I mean, that's great. Um, but do we have any um, like work that look at knowledge assumption in the quantum world? 
Like, what do we know about making this kind of assumptions? I'm not an expert, obviously. So it's sort of that was the first question that came up in my mind was, what do we know? Like this idea that there's the only possible algorithm is the algorithm that uses this particular secret that we extract, right? Right. Is that what kind of what validates that assumption when we're looking about quantum algorithms? So uh, as far as I know, there seems to be no literature uh, which studies uh, knowledge assumptions specifically in the quantum setting. However, there, there did exist uh, a knowledge assumption in the lattice setting that is uh, uh, the assumption that uh, a certain lattice-based encryption scheme is so-called linear only. So you can perform only linear operation on them. And this is a, a knowledge uh, assumption. Right. Um, and since it's lattice-based, uh, you could believe that it holds also against quantum computers, but I'm not aware of uh, any work that studies this uh, specifically. I, I think I have a paper with that assumption. So I am familiar ah. with that. One. Yeah, yeah, but right. uh, I mean, yeah, yeah, yeah. But I, I was like more in general, the, the relationship, you know, sort of we know what the relationship between the random oracle and the quantum world is in, you know, right. And I, I don't think anybody has looked as you're saying about the relationship right. in general between knowledge assumptions and the quantum world. Right. Okay. So I don't see, oh, does your parameter, sorry, does your paper set concrete parameters? Um, so the concrete parameters, uh, yes, we do consider some concrete parameters. And these concrete parameters are based on uh, best attacks. So we simply uh, say that uh, it seems that the best attack against these new assumptions is to just solve the sys instance uh, in the old school way, and therefore we use the best uh, attacks against sys to set our parameters. And so what I can say at the moment is that uh, asymptotically they look great, but uh, concretely speaking, they are like a, a some orders of magnitude uh, higher than uh, the competitors, but not not too high. So uh, it, we think that this um, is a, a viable approach. So. Uh, 